Vancouver Sun wants to talk this afternoon. So. Good. Yeah, I'm getting into the press and it can't get back on this. <laughs> it's a public law controversy. They are. <laughs> yeah. I'm not What are they want? Just an interview. It's going to be following the Bellcarrot story all along. On the Vancouver Sun. Yeah. Vancouver Sun keeps up the Vancouver Sun stories. The easy political. <laughs> the irony is that Chris has been writing Vancouver Sun stories has left the sun and you know with Metro Vancouver. Oh, no way. So it's like a total new cast of characters. Well, he's so disappointed in that I call it a collaborative Exactly. Those <laughs> press releases don't really exist. Okay. Uh, uh, All of the things going on lead me to believe it must be 930. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Call the meeting to order. So, Hope. Good. So this morning we only have one on table item, um, and that is a letter relating to item 5.1 of the agenda, the uh, development variance part for 7374 Billington. Um, and other than that, that's all for the regular council agenda. Okay. Anybody else have any additions they want to make to the agenda this morning? Notice how I just asked that so nicely, as if maybe somebody might. <laughs> Are you trying to drag things out? Well, I think a 15 minute meeting might be a little bit. <laughs> I don't think that is no. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second, it all in favor, pass it down. Okay, public comment section. Uh, we have Greg Rowland regarding 1774 Village and Road. Yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Honorable Council Members. Uh, before you, and unfortunately late last night, I sent a copy of the letter which I trust everybody has before them. And generally I don't uh, get involved in this level of things, but there's been certain allegations and uh, things said about my professional conduct and my interaction both with the city. And, um, and I, I thought it would be appropriate that I at least responded kind to some of the allegations made uh, to protect my professional reputation because I do plan on doing more uh, projects here on Bowen Island and that uh, things are right before council. So there's a letter that I sent in with some difficulty because the oversized scan uh, dated yesterday that I uh, think everybody has. It generally speaks for itself and uh, I just want to come before council and make a personal appearance on that behalf to make clarity to any allegations of wrongdoing or of uh, unclean hands that we come before you today with our application as being considered. So if there's any questions, I'm certainly going to be sitting here. Uh, uh, if there's anything else required of me, I'll be here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Do we have anything to bring before we move on? Oh. Thank you Thank for your audience. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, right in here, should we Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Brendan Hirsch. I'm here today with my family to show our opposition for the DDP application before you at 1774 Billington Road. I believe you're aware of our specific concerns as we've noted in a recent letter to Council on April 6th. But my comments today are of a more general nature. What has occurred on Strata Lot 5 or 1774 Billington Road has been a complete disregard for municipal bylaws strata bylaws, environmental stewardship, and common respect for community. As you may know, environmental safeguards, as su suggested by a QEP last summer, were completely disregarded during the months of unpermitted blasting, clearing, and construction that ensued in violation of the allowable distance to the sea. To now believe, as you are being asked to, that this professional builder developer couple has no knowledge of simple building requirements, such as knowing with a survey where their proposed house is being built, or knowing what the local rules are that govern such construction, is disrespectful to all of our intelligence. I will tell you that one year ago, my wife and I, neither of us professional builder developers, were able to understand the rules perfectly well simply by reading them on your website. What has transpired to date and what is proposed before you today 
has been devastating for my wife and I to witness. As a young couple building our first home next door, we assumed that the rules governing this island, those same rules that we built in accordance with, would likewise be there to support and protect us and to preserve, preserve the beauty of this shoreline. You are left now with a proposal in front of you for a carriage home and main home, which from our calculations appear to be a combined greater than 5,500 square feet of building that will create more than 3,000 square feet of walls facing the water. And all of this to be pushed nearly 20 feet forward into the allowable distance to the sea. I will say that when we chose our home property several years ago, we never imagined that this council, representing this island's people, would allow this mega home compound to be built with an exception to be closer to the sea. Hanging over the most beautiful of sunset beaches, a three-story house, a two-story garage, and what appears to be a 264 square foot retaining wall will be an affront to all who see it. For council to approve this variance request, is for Council to set a very scary precedent for future development on the north of Bowen. With the message being that one should do as the Zane Roland couple has done. Chop and blast as close to the water as you can get, and then come back after and request a variance permit, hoping to be too far along in the process to be turned back. I do worry that problems with these people will not go away for our community after this decision is made but by upholding the values of the island, the official community plan, and the Green Shores approach to building, Council can choose to send a message today that this apparently intentional disregard for our beautiful land is not to be tolerated. My wife and I wanted to be here today in front of you so that you can see how much the decision by Council today impacts ourselves and our children, both in the short term and for many years to come. I would welcome any questions, either now or following the meeting. And I do thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Do you have any questions? No. Thank you. Okay. So, consent agenda. No. Anybody have anything no, no. to pull on that? Yes. Could I call 3.4? 3.4. Okay. Keep on what? Four. 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 Uh, can I also, is this also the time when I pull an information item as well? Um, 12, 13. Okay. First of all, let's take 3.4. Uh, put that on the I'm having a good time. 3.4. And then you wanted to pull what from the information? 12, 13. 12, 13. And we're throwing those in section one. Okay. Yeah, we'll put those, uh, we'll put a stick on 11 as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, motion to approve consent agenda? Okay. Seconded. All in favor? Passed unanimously. Okay. <laughs> Looking for the beginning of the agenda, I found the whole thing. <laughs> okay. So, Daniel, good morning. So, thank you, Mayor Council. I'm here today to present a variance permit for 1774 Billington Road. Um, the variance for Council's consideration. So just a, a refresher, so um, we're talking about Lot 5 on Billington Road, located on the north shore of Long Island, the continuation of Woods Road, um, and then up the Strata Road, going to Road, Lot 5. Um, in terms of the land use file, it's in the RR1 zone, and so in particular, relevance for this application is that we've got setback from the C regulation, so 
Um, we require no part of the building or structure cited within 30 meters of the natural boundary of the sea, um, except for, then we have this um, exception where you can be based on the minimum setback of your neighboring property. So the minimum of 15 meters based on the calculation of the average the existing setback from the natural boundary and the lot on either side of the subject lot. Um, one lot, one lot state can just use it as a 30 meter setback. Um, and then you measure the average distance for, from the outermost exterior walls of the principal building, excluding decks, where the two perimeter walls contact each other in the ground floor surface to the natural boundary of the sea. So this is sort of this variation that's built into our bylaw that allows somebody to build closer without needing a variance. They can just follow the line of bylaw and it contains sort of averaging provision. Um, so when we look at this, this property, on um, one side it's vacant, so 30 meters, and they're 18.5. Sorry, give us the average setback requirement of 24.25 meters. Um, in terms of what's before you, what, um, there's a housing proposal that's before you to be um, a minimum of 20.47 meters, so that's moving from this midpoint of the house to this, this area of the natural boundary. Um, and a proposed deck to extend into that um, setback to be a minimum of 17.9 meters from the sea. Um, so as part of this application, um, staff of Preston got an environmental report. So one was submitted initially um, prior to work starting, and then one was submitted February 28th. Um, made a series of recommendations in terms of um, yeah, how to proceed with this with this application. So there's some, some recommendations in there that are captured in the variance permit that's before you. Um, to do with removing woody debris, covering exposed soils, um, sediment fencing, sediment fencing to be installed, um, and removal of the spilled ship rock, shot rock on the seaward side of the proposed retaining wall. Um, so in terms of what's all in your in your package, the applicant submitted the letter and then another one um, last night outlining their request and variance um, and submitted the letter from a septic professional about the septic field. Um, this is an old one, I apologize, but Let me just find my proper notes here. I'm all well um, but in terms of applications, this came before council in the March 27th meeting. And at that point, we issued notice for the April 24th meeting, and council attended a site visit um, as well. And at the site visit, the applicant also provided um, a timeline from their perspective of of the application, and that's in your package as well. Um, and the recommendation before you for the report um, is that council um, that council issue development variance permit 02 2017. Um, so that's the end of the presentation that I have. Well, I look for my further notes, but I have to answer any questions on this on this application. Okay, we'll start with that question. Can you go back and put the map up? Mm -hmm. <coughs> this one. And you don't happen to have the map of the one next door, do you? I have it, um, but not on the... But they're not side by side. No. Um, if we go... Like this shows, so this house is located about here, um, and the neighboring house is sort of in here. Okay. Um, so back to the map. <coughs> so the dotted line is the setback. Mm -hmm. The dotted black line is the required setback line. That's the hundred. That's the calculation based on the app. Yeah, this is twenty four point two five meters. So one of the corners is in, and the other one isn't, um, and that average setback is just done at the building permit stage. Yeah, so that's if somebody came and wanted, without needing a variance to council, but just wanted to build, they would yeah. be able to build based on the average of the neighbors. That would be a building permit. They'd okay. say, based on that land by I can build. So it's part of the issue here is the fact that they started construction without applying for the building permit. Is there a fine for having started without the building permit. Mm -hmm. So in our building bylaw, um, if a sub notice is issued, the pay additional charge equal to 100% of the building permit fee prior to obtaining the required building permit. Okay. And 
the Ellen Whitehead report, the first one, um, is that roughly the siting that came out of that report is the best location? Um, it's the siting that's in the report. Alan yeah, Alan Whitehead's report. He's yeah, so I him. wouldn't say it said the best location, but it's sort of a proposed location, and then it outlines steps to be taken based on the location. Okay, but he didn't say this was it. No, it says yeah. So based on that location. Okay. Okay. I, yeah. I'm, yeah. I guess my concern is more the process. I, I mean, I think had they come and applied for a variance. And based on having read Alan Whitehead's report, I would have granted the variance. I don't have a problem with it. And looking at the site, I don't know where else you would have put it. Um, and it's it's within the sizes and all that sort of stuff, so that's not an issue. Um, yeah. Do you want to say uh, Yes. Um, yeah, given your presentation right now, and given if there wasn't um, some contrary problems with the uh, with the neighbors and stuff like that in the process, I, I I think this council historically probably would have granted that the DVP. Uh, having said that, we have some complications here. There's no question about that, um, and I think that. I think that the proponent here, the DVP, the applicant, should have known better, given your history, and went ahead and did it. Now, I, I have a little problem with at what point are you violating the, the situation. I, I think it did violate the situation. Now, having said that, there's going to be penalties assessed um, to that, and I don't think there's any question that those are those are actual penalties that should be assessed in this situation. You know, we have a tradition on Bowen Island of going ahead and doing it and asking forgiveness later. And uh, there has to be, I think there has to be some kind of penalty involved here. So I'm in favor of granting the DVP um, with penalties assessed. And I would also like to see if that can be, we'll see what everybody else says, but I would like to see the retaining wall. And we talked about this. There was some deal about greening it up and making it green and fit in because that, that is quite obvious from the beach next door. The mass into the house is not going to change from the beach. The mass, whether you bring that line back or not, you're still going to see that massing. So that's not really a concern. Um, and I would say from the neighbor's perspective on the, on the roof overhang and the deck, those are quite prominent structures that are 46 feet from the, the ocean so I, I don't think there's a there's much of an argument there anyway I'm in, I'm in favor of the DVP and we'll see where it goes and that's about it for me okay. do we have anyone else no, so I have got two questions one um, seeing as how the setback um, available was less because of the neighbor's DVP. Um, if we allow this uh, DVP, will that affect the next neighbor? It, it will, yeah. So if the house is built, let's say it's built 20 meters from the sea, because I can do that math in my head, and the neighbors, and then this a lot for them could build, like this lot. If, if these people go ahead and build it at 20 meters, just for Take of my, my math in my head, and they would be they could end up at 25 meters. Okay, so it has a cascading um, yeah. effect. Okay, yeah. thank you. And the other question was um, relating to the idea that Gary brought up uh, penalties. Uh, what kinds of penalties have we got available to us apart from the doubling of the building permit fee? I mean that is in our in our building bylaw. That is you know what's laid out for for a stop work order. So right? the consequence of a stop work order is then the building permit. And how much is a building permit? It's based on the percentage of value of the house. Um, so it ends up being several thousand dollars. It'll depend on the, the value. Um, okay. Well, I, I see there's two issues here. One of them is that there uh, was no building permit sought before work was begun, and uh, that one. I think it's a pretty significant one in terms of you know looking at 
provincial website about three bylaws, and they say um, bylaws and permit restrictions will be ineffective unless landowners and permit holders know how local government will act. And uh, I just I see that as a pretty significant um, issue in front of us. And the second one is uh, that the building um, was begun to be constructed closer to the shoreline. Um, and uh, for those two reasons, I'm going to say I'm not in favor of allowing this uh, development permit uh, variance. A few more points. Um, it's not just the views of the neighbors that concern me. It's the um, effect of the view, impact of the views uh, from the water uh, and from neighboring islands uh, and from um, other people that might uh, build there nearby in the future um, because uh, this is an area under construction. So there aren't very many neighbors yet. And um, I'm, uh, we're, we're an island within the Islands Trust. And this is a, a special, perm, a special um, area. And I'm going to read from something that's in our agenda on page um, 138. Um, and this is a letter from the Islands Trust um, to the province. And uh, just describes it nicely. Um, unlike most local governments, you know, islands uh, or local governments within the Islands Trust, there's a specific provincial interest in land use planning and under our object to preserve and protect these islands, not just for the 25,000 residents, speaking of the whole of trust area, and the non resident landholders, but for all British Columbians, including, in British Columbians, including the First Nations who publicly asserted. Uh, Aboriginal title. So, to me, um, as an elected Islands Trust trustee, um, uh, this is not in the public interest to issue this DGP. Secondly, I think um, of this impact on the next lot, the cascading impact of uh, allowing um, DVPs on the next lots. Um, and third, um, I think it's a uh, Contrary to many parts of the OCP, that our official community plan that um, direct us to protect the shoreline and that people care about the shoreline. And in fact, it's priority 83 in our um, in our own strategic island plan is protect the shoreline. Not in this specific way. It relates more to docks and um, uh, social planning issues like Union Bay and uh, uh, Green Shores approach to development. And uh, and the that's another reason. And the third, the fourth one, is the uh, impact on future builders on Bowen Island. What what message are we sending if we allow this DVP um, to be uh, to go ahead? And uh, and then I heard this morning that um, these proponents would also like to be involved in other future building projects on Bowen, um, but. Whether it's them or somebody else, what message are we sending? So for those reasons, I'm uh, not in favor. Next, if I may. Daniel, should this TVP be granted, does this mean then that the construction then goes ahead, that's the end of it, the TVP is granted, and that assuming that all the regulations are followed, construction will begin? Um, so with the variance granted then it has conditions in it about um, the environmental work that needs to happen in advance, so for pre construction meeting and, and those things, and then a build-in permit would be issued as well for construction planning. Because, because um, Councillor Ander mentioned the greening of the wall as just one item. Okay. So if the PVP is to be granted, at what stage do we approve the, if you like, the remedial work or the work to satisfy some of the points raised by their neighbours? At what point is, is, is that actually catalogued, noted, and whatever? Because it's nothing worse than being caught on the back foot, which is what we are here, because something has happened, the whole process has gone awry, and now we're trying to sort it out. Okay. And unfortunately, we've got, we're dealing with parties who are not necessarily all thinking in the same way, but that's the way it is. Um, so my, my, my question is, if we are to grant a DVP, I, for one, would really, really like to be very, very sure of exactly what this is going to look like, not just in terms of bricks and mortar and square feet and construction, but what it is going to look like from the beach, because we did the tour. 
from that house, this is not particularly obvious. I mean, it, it, it is, it is, it is shocking. From the beach, it absolutely is. So I, I have very mixed feelings on, on this issue at all, largely because the process has gone so awry, it makes life difficult. But in the, in the, in the, in the, in the spirit of moving on, I, my question is, where do we stand with exactly what this is going to look like when it's finished? To, to, uh, to the hopefully benefit both parties, and I really do feel that like sitting on, I'm, I'm really not sure on this one, I'm very undecided. So the variance that's before you for consideration um, following the, the environmental report um, has several steps where, where we're requiring confirmation and writing from an um, environmental monitor to provide that the following, some of the steps have been completed. And then we're requiring a deposit with the variance that gets refunded then upon, upon completion that, and confirmation of those steps have been followed. So that's to address the, the environmental recommendations in the report. Um, yeah, rather than necessarily sort of the, the visual impact is, you know, when it gets built and it's what it is, rather than the environmental steps which have to be followed. And what about the aesthetic steps? The, the, this great big wall, how that's going to be, as an example, yeah. what, where does that get uh, written in? Yeah, so the wall, I mean, our land use bylaw permits retaining walls of up to 2.5 meters to be anywhere on the lot, so it's such that you know, per permission for the wall is a building permit application and part of the variance application. So the wall is a legal structure? The wall requires a building permit, but we permit with a building permit a retaining wall up to 2.5 meters. Okay, can I, can I jump in for a minute? Okay, so I think we've got three issues. Uh, we have the building permit issue, which which is being dealt with basically by a fine by doubling the building permit for proceeding without it. We have the development permit issue, which is a is staff that is handling that. Right. So um, my question for you, Daniel, is what are the consequences for not conforming to a development permit when you have the environmental consultant saying you have to do this and you don't do it? Is it just a matter that money is held back until you ultimately do do it? Um, that type of is it money hold back? Is there a finding process? Is yeah. there anything like that? You're talking about the DDP. So, so no, I'm talking about the DP first. What DP? The so development DP. permit is the eco, the environmental permit. There's no DP. There's no DP there. Oh, okay. there's a creek that runs on the um, okay <laughs> west side of the property, but they're far enough away that they don't need a DP. So the environmental report from Alan Whitehead was. Uh, because everybody has to do that? Or? So that's something that we as staff ask for, for a variance permit for setback to the sea. Oh, I see. Fair yeah. enough. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I misunderstand. Yeah. Okay. So um, so that aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't, if they were further back, they yeah. wouldn't have needed to do that at all. Yeah. So, so there's kind of an implicit understanding, isn't there, that if they needed to have that environmental permit, that it was part of the DVP process from the permit. That's part of the, that confusion. When, when the first one was done, right. it was then on the understanding that they didn't need the very, like between the applicant and the environmental um, consultant, that they didn't, they were far enough back that they didn't need a variance permit. But at that point, they didn't confirm it with the planning department. Yeah, so it didn't apply for a building permit and start it. I'm going to understand that it didn't, that it didn't need a variance permit. Okay, so that's And then when we get the top of order, that's when we confirm no, they do need a variance permit. Okay, gotcha. That's a process. Uh, uh, can, let me just finish up for a minute, okay, Melanie? And then yeah, I'll yeah, get yeah. through my points and I'll sure. come back here. So the, uh, uh, this is something where I would be in favor of giving the variance permit in spite of many, many things mainly because we don't control the square footage of the house, we don't control the mass of the house and that sort of thing. And if we're talking about uh, a few feet forward or back, the view from the sea, the view from the neighbors, that sort of thing, doesn't substantially change. And I believe that if the applicant had come to us uh, in the beginning and said, look, I've got a, a 20 foot high rock wall right there, and I'd like to put my forms in front of it. Uh, and this is going to mean that we're very similar to what our neighbor is as far as distance from the sea. I think we would have 
improved it. And I think that all of this other stuff um, as, as disappointing or controversial as it is, um, is really extraneous to that decision. So, uh, sorry, Melanie, I just have a question. So, do you, do you even understand why the building permit wasn't sought before construction was built? Um, so, from the applicant, it was they wanted to do the excavation to confirm that they could build in that location and build far enough from the sea that that they didn't that they didn't need the variance. They built did the excavation, started the forms to confirm that they could meet what they had thought was the setback line. Okay, I'm going to go to Gary and then. Yeah, and around that confusion, I think there has to be some clarity brought into the either the planning department or the building department about the process of building. And I can tell you on Bowen, yeah. and I've done it a lot of times, you go ahead and you can build the forms and it comes from a couple of different sources that you're allowed to do that at a risk. If you go ahead and put the forms in and they're in the wrong place, you're going to have to change them yeah. and or request the DPP. So you run that risk and it's a very, very high money risk to do that. Having said that, um, I don't think that people should be going ahead, but I don't think there's a definition of the time you have to get. Yeah, how far you how far you can actually go without getting a building permit. Yeah. And that is that I well I'll let that yeah. I, I was gonna say so one thing is so when, when you apply for a building permit, we require a site plan. We don't require the survey. Correct. So people then build the forms, you know, on the understanding that their site plan is correct and they survey it before they pour. So at that point they're doing that at their own risk. Like they better be sure that they that they know where it is, because if they then survey it and they're off, then they have to you know, do it all over again. Our, our building permit does say that um, no person shall commence or continue any construction, blah, 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 including excavation or other work related to construction unless a building official has issued a valid, valid permit. So I'd say excavation and other work relating to construction. So we should be issuing a whole bunch of stuff and orders and fines then. Uh, all I'm saying is that there should be there should be some clarity that goes through the whole system here because it, it, it definitely isn't there. Yeah. And I'm not going to point any fingers, but then it, just, it has to it has to go through the whole system. Just 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 to clarify, I started building forms in 2001 and got a red stop work order thrown up on the place, and I was faced with paying double <laughs> building permit. This has been around forever. There's nothing new about this, and anybody who does that does do it at their own risk. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to it. So it's not yeah. this understanding that, oh, the forms are built to be torn down is fine. It makes perfect sense. However, it is not the way the bylaws work it. And the wording right. of the bylaw, I mean, basically, I think the message here is we're going to enforce the bloody bylaw and that, and that people can want to go out. Now, whether or not you can take it to the point of excavation as opposed to corn building, I certainly would think we should draw a line there because how the heck do you know where you're going to put that house until you see your subsurface conditions? So to say you can't dig them on your own lawn. Uh, I think is, is pushing it, but certainly building forms I, <coughs> strikes me that a lot of people have gotten into a lot of trouble on this island building those forms ahead of time mm -hmm. <laughs> because they weren't exactly where they thought it was because of their lack of a site survey or correct survey or understanding of property lines or strata corporation rules or whatever. Right? And the having the building permit in place before you build that form, everything else is taken care of then ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, well, just a, just a quick point. I mean, there are some just some certain private property rights, and you can dig a hole in your property if you want to dig a hole, and you can do some excavating on your property if you want to excavate your property. You can take all the trees out, you can do whatever you want, but you cannot, you know. And we've always been allowed to put forms in, but we could, couldn't pour concrete and so on. Right, but that's the actual that's. But it's, it's a misunderstanding. It's, it's, it's a misunderstanding. I'm going to go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I just want to revisit the question of, of penalties. Um, Sue Ellen was asking what additional penalties might be available in this circumstance. So, as I understand it, there is a, a doubled uh, building mm -hmm. permit fee, and that amounts to just a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean. You know, it depends on the value of the house, basically how it has their building, but it's, it's really under 1,000. 
Is there one percent? One percent is the deposit, and then a building permit fee is like so much for the first per thousand for the first hundred thousand, and then so much per thousand for the next hundred thousand of building value. But it ends up being you know under five thousand dollars. I would say the building permit fee, and then we charge one percent of the value as a deposit, and that would remain the same, and that gets returned it occupancy. So it's it's not going to go above ten. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah, I haven't done the math on there. Value, but yeah. Okay. And um, with the uh, DDP, there's also a security mm -hmm. deposit, yeah. 5K that's been yeah. stipulated here, which is unusual. Ordinarily, we don't have security deposits noted yeah. on our DD DDPs. Um, those, those seem to be to be relatively modest numbers. And uh, are there other penalties? That could be there. Um, so I would say that the variance permit deposit isn't necessarily a penalty as much as a sort of just guarantee that the conditions are met. So typically, you know, the work hasn't been done, and so we don't require a deposit. Um, in this case, because there's remediation steps that we felt that a deposit was was appropriate to make sure that the remediation takes place, um, as opposed to normally it's sort of making sure you don't do something. So don't, you know. And if the person failed to do the necessary remediation, they would lose the five. Right? Yeah, I mean, technically, I think it's so that we would then spend the money to do the remediation work. And the five k would be sufficient to do that. Yeah, I mean, it would depend, but we wouldn't pay more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other points you want to make? No. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. so can we, is there a requirement to have the environmental monitor on site when this remediation work is being done? Like I'm thinking of the, the fill on the water side that's going to be the backfill. So there's a requirement that the monitor be there at the pre-construction meeting um, and to do inspections, periodic inspections, and then to certify that the work has okay. been done. But We've, the construction has started, so mm -hmm. I think there needs to that as if that was already I suggested we needed to change yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. So the environmental monitor needs to be on site at, immediately after the DDP is granted. Yeah. So I, I, I reworded to say that before the start of the work under the permit to be okay. clear that because yeah because in some sense construction started but in other sense it's like the construction that will start as a result of this permit and the building permit. Okay, but yeah. they, they can decide to be on site during some of the work, mm -hmm. like the stuff that's a little bit more sensitive. Yeah, and so from that sense, that's why we require just to report them to report to us in writing that the work has been done, and then it's sort of their professional you know, determination, like what do I need to see in person versus to, in order to, to, to sign off that the work has been done versus what could I just you know, come and visit to, to verify that it's all been removed. Just a reminder, this is yeah. the opportunity for council to add conditions mm -hmm. to the yeah, well, for sure. sort of yeah. saying, I guess because there's two very sensitive areas that have been identified, I think we should require the monitor to be on site, the QEP to be on site when that works. I'll talk to him. Well, is it in there that he, or, I mean. I think I put, um, to participate in the pre-construction meeting and to inspect the work site periodically during construction. So it's not okay. continual monitoring, but it's visits. Uh, just in reference to that greening up of the, um, the yeah. retaining wall, because the retaining wall is going to be very visible from the mm -hmm. beach. And it's got to be, uh, whether you put some rock on the front of it or do something to, to make it not, just not pure concrete. You green it out, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. but. Are we noted that, that one, we want that in the DVP? Is everybody in favor or how does that work? You would have to make a motion of it. Okay. Well, can we add that as a condition of the DVP? I mean, the, the, the challenge with that is the retaining wall itself isn't a part of the variance permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, the applicant has noted that that's their intention is to do it. If, if we do it as a separate resolution, yeah. separate from the DVP. And it would be that council request that staff consider at the time the addition of the building permit. As an additional condition of the building permit? For the law. Okay. Nothing for the building permit applied for for the law? Yes. 
I'm thinking about the um, prior discussions we've had about greening up of other walls um, in this community and the cost involved in actually doing that. I'm just concerned that the security deposit that's associated with this DBP is insufficient if we have to take on the responsibility for making sure that certain things are done on the site. Yeah, I, mean, no, I think the thing here is that on top of it, you, 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 you plant a, something that will fall down in front of the wall. Yeah, or build so into the wall. They do that now. Yeah. yeah, well, they can't, but I mean, that drives out the guys. But if you, if, if you have the, a planting on top of the wall, an IV, Virginia Creeper, that sort of thing, but one that's not an invasive species, <laughs> whatever that one might be, uh, I would think that that would be the logical way of, of having the wall read the screen from the water. Yeah, I'm not so much talking about the nature of the plantings, but just ensuring that there is sufficient funds for us to do work that needs to be done in the event that the proponent doesn't do it. Daniel, I mean, I know you're not a mm -hmm. professional yeah. environmental but do you think the $5,000 is sufficient to cover remedial work if the municipality has to complete? I mean, it would depend, you know, how much remedial work. I don't know if would it cover, no. Um, typically, I would think if we have, you know, same with the building permit, we get a deposit so that we could complete stuff, in this case, generally on the public side, but more we use it as the leverage to, to make the applicant do it. I think this is something in the order of 30 or 35 foot wall trip. Long, right? Longer. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 The greening could be as simple as planting things that will grow up at. Mm, yeah, theoretically. Mm -hmm. So I'm just picking up from the conversation that's happening around the table. It sounds like the, the wall um, is more of the issue than the actual building. So I'm just wondering if the building was required to be behind the setback would there still be the need for that retaining wall? Yeah. Or do we move the whole thing back? So in that case... I think the, the building permit has been issued for the wall. It hasn't been issued, it's been applied for. But would, if if the building was need, was if we do not issue, if we, today if we decide not to issue the DVP and the building has to go behind the... And we have no control of the wall at that point. But does that remove the need for that wall to be where it is? And does that just naturally pull it back? No, the wall doesn't need to be there. The wall is there to raise the front to give them a front yard. I mean, it's but but their front yard would then move back. I think their house was further be, back. Be bigger. And Daniel, just for clarity, mm -hmm. if uh, with the wall being built, is, is that required within the setback? It can be anywhere on the wall. So yeah. irrespective of where the house is, we can yeah. say we can put the wall within those setbacks. So we have yeah. no requirement to have to require them to take the wall down or anything else. And yeah. they have nothing in the bylaws that says walls have to be. Created. They could have they could have built that wall without yeah. the requirement yeah. for DVD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now required that it be green. Yeah, we'll do that by separate council resolution. Yeah. If that is agreeable to, if, that, if that's the little council, yeah. Uh, that would be after the DTT? Or I would that? suggest pass that resolution first. Oh, no, I said yeah. Okay. 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 After. Yeah. Yeah. After. yeah, because if you're against the DDP and you lose and the DDP goes ahead, you want to have the input into the wall. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Sure. I'd like to move the council that Mr. Bellman uh, variance permit DDP 02 2017 for the variance of setback to the C for 1774, Billington World, legally described as Strata Lot 5, District Lot 2958, uh, Group 1, New Westminster District Strata Plan BCS 4476P, ID 02 8883 934. Okay, do I have a second? Okay, second. Yeah, just one comment. Uh, as far as the neighborhood is concerned, they did get consent from uh, John Tennant, who's chair of the uh, who's chair of the strat. So that was they had uh, approval there for this. Uh, no, I'm sorry, just so I understand. I was just I was just yeah, there. no no that's no, chair. He approved the the building there. The, the, the variance. The variance. Okay, so yeah. he had prior knowledge of. Of the location. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Just, 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 just as an aside. Yeah, yeah. Just, 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 so anybody who lives within the Strata Corporation before they get a building permit has to have a letter from the Strata Corporation saying they've satisfied the Strata bylaws. But the Strata Council is okay with it. I would say that we got a letter from, from the tenants as neighbors mm -hmm. to okay. that they support the variance okay. request. Not Just from the Strata Corporation? Is it, is it from, I think it's from it as neighbors, mm -hmm. as the neighbors and owners of Block 4 that they... So is as neighbors, not as... Yeah, rather than a chair of the Strata. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we got anything from the Strata. So there was nothing on file from the Strata. Well, we wouldn't usually see that, would we? Well, yes. We would normally... Well, yeah. yeah. If there's a strata involved, they often ask, but the, unless the strata bylaws require the strata council to approve, then it just depends on what the bylaws say. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so when the municipality is going to issue a building permit and the lot is inside the strata corporation, does the municipality not, as a matter of course, ask for a letter from the strata corporation? Um, so, yeah, for this building permit, it does it has a building scheme on it that's controlled by the strata. So, yeah, the strata, we would seek strata to sign off on the building permit. Right. So that will be required before you issue a building yeah. permit. Yeah. yeah. So that will be part of the process going forward. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Let us assume that the strata did not agree, for example. The strata has the right to either agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. Let's assume it did not agree. What happens then? Mm -hmm. if, if there's a um, covenant on title, it's a building scheme between you know, the strata and the property, then we seek the strata to sign off on the building permit. Plan. It depends on what the, what the covenant and the building scheme yeah. says. Is it for mm -hmm. form of character? Do you know that? Yeah, to a large extent, yeah. May I ask respectfully, would it be wise to have this step clarified before we go any further? Just asking the question, would it be wise to have this step clarified? Don't say that it, it, it's the next step in the process for the Strata Corporation to uh, make a decision on whether or not to allow the building to go ahead. I think they would want to know that the municipality was willing to issue a variance permit. Otherwise, it's, it's an academic exercise for them. However, once we've done the, the variance permit, then it goes to the strata council well, with the plans, with the permits in place. It all depends mm -hmm. on what strata rules the covenant, right. the mm -hmm. building scheme says. If the building scheme is entirely for form and character, then it doesn't matter who, what the strata says. Mm -hmm. If the building scheme is for location, siting, and form and character, as ours is, then the strata council has to sign off on the whole thing. But so it just really depends on what that building scheme says. But, but whether we give a DVP or not, right? They don't get a building permit uh, until there's clarity with the strata Correct. corporation. Correct. So there's no real need for us to wait for the strata corporation to make their decision. They, they, uh, my understanding would be they would fall between the EVP and the building permit. But if, and I would gather, yeah. guess, that if if the form and character, if the, what is it called? The, it's a, it's a the building scheme. The building scheme says the strata council must approve the siting of the building, then they would have written Michael, I, I, I can share with you if there is any issues between the Strata Corporation prior to issuing the building permit, we will get legal counsel. We will call it legal counsel. Okay. Because we cannot reach an impasse. We've got to move beyond an impasse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm trying to just to ensure fairness to all parties that the, the, these, are, in this quite complicated yeah. procedure, made more complicated by the, the mess up on the process, that the necessary steps that are approved. And if we do approve this step, just what it is we are approving. Okay, so we've got 30 on that. Um, any other discussion before I call the question? Okay, all in favor of granting the DVP of the recommendation before council. Those in favor? Okay, we have three in favor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those opposed? We have four opposed? Okay, so the DVP is not Granted. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we don't need to talk about any recommendations. No. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, that's it.
I just wanted to um, update you on the results of the final um, completed tax roll. And it was interesting, we started the year with a preliminary tax roll value of um, 2 billion, 70 million, 620,000. And by the time the uh, appeals process had taken place, the tax roll lost about $4 million. It went down to 2,066,000. Two billion sixty-six million eight hundred seventy-eight thousand. So a little bit lost there. How but many oh, appeals were actually filed. Do you think? I don't know the actual number, but there are still um, a couple that are at the parcel. Uh, or sorry, the property appeal board that's yet to be decided. Mm -hmm. But again, because we are so um, heavily uh, single-family residential, any one um, appeal by any property owner would have any impact or any significance to us. So this um, bylaw needs to be adopted before May 15th, so the plan is to give three readings today and three readings on May 8th, and we will be ready to go to share our tax notices. Three readings and three readings? <laughs> three readings. Did I say three readings again on May 8th? How about just um, fourth and adoption? <coughs> How about that? Uh, it's just reading the summer. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions for the Yes. What was last year's mill rate for general class? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Last year's municipal tax rate for residential? Uh, 2015, the tax rate, 2016 tax rate was 2.55, and it's now dropped to 2.177. Okay. And that gives our an average increase of 2.5 percent. Correct. Yep. Okay. So does someone have to, or any other questions? I have a question. It's not directly related to, to this, but in some correspondence I read a while back, um, there was a mention of the percentage increase that would be necessary to bring in an additional forty-five or fifty thousand dollars. Do you recall this, or um, mm -hmm. a, a percentage, uh, like an increase to the tax yeah. rate? Yeah. Um, yeah, about 1% increase would generate another $45,000. So, so it's that large an increase mm -hmm. to generate that small yeah, amount. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted that confirmed. Yeah. 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 yeah, it sounds a lot worse than what you <laughs> on a cost-benefit analysis thing. It sounds awfully bad for the amount of money. It, exactly, because we were talking about the, you know, the, looking at the future increases, and when you actually did that, a whole 1% gave us less than $50,000. Yeah. I mean, that was... Yeah. yeah. Right. It's not a big amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for it. Okay. Any further discussion before we get this read? I just want to thank Chris for her hard work on this. Yeah. Well, yeah. Seven, Seventeen years of working here, <laughs> and since she's taken over this process, it's amazingly. Yeah, I've been here for seventeen years. Yeah. But it's not a major process it used to be. No, it's been here, right? It's been fun. It's fun. Yeah. Fun. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. 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 How many hours does this take, by the way? This whole process, I mean, I know it's a bit of care. The hard part's the budgeting part and getting yeah. everything okay. to that part. This is just a math. This is math. This is, math. This is, math. This is the form that you push back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, do you want to read this for us? I don't have it in front of me. Uh, I love it. I love it. I'm going to file on number 435-2017, cited as Bone Island Municipality Annual Tax Rate by line number 4. 35, 2017, being the first, second, and third time. Do I have a seconder? And any further discussion before I call the question? All in favor, pass unanimously. Okay. And the parcel taxes? They were on the consent agenda. They were on the consent agenda. Yes. Okay. We have no staff reports. No or correspondence. Was it 12.13 to that 100 correspondence? 3.4. Uh, 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 well, information. Yeah, but okay. I, my apologies. That shouldn't have gone under information item. Uh, but so if you received it late Friday afternoon and 
And I just got a text about it, so I didn't quite be quite aware of what it was. So my apologies for that. Okay. Are we going to get copies of that? So where are we? Are we on section 11? I didn't move from the consent agenda. Or are we in no, the no, 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 no. Um, I was just uh, clarifying what, whether I should be talking about anything other correspondence. So reports of committees dealt with consent agenda. Melody, anything on the movie declaration? So are we doing. Are we on 10.1? 10.1. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. We've removed the items from the consent agenda that we put under mm -hmm. the oh, oh, is that? Okay, fine. Okay, great. Yes. Well, I hope everybody read there. Okay, so we'll do Communities on the Move Declaration. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody read through it and hope mm -hmm. everybody's in support. Does anybody have any questions? Fits really well with, I think, where we want to go with our active transportation. It's really about advocating at the upper levels of government to give us more money to be able to do all these wild and great plans. So. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, so what exactly are we passing? Motion. What, there's a motion? No. Endorsing? Yeah, what is what are we passing? Oh, we signed the it's declaration. To, well, yeah, yes. there's no... There's, no there's, there's nothing in the email that has a draft resolution. How about that, uh, the, uh, the mayor on behalf of council be authorized to sign the declaration? Okay. They're asking for signing of the declaration. Yeah. It's on um, page 102. Mm -hmm. And hope to flesh out what the declaration mm -hmm. actually is. Mm -hmm. I would move that. Okay. Seconder? Yes. Okay. And all of those in favor? Yes. Okay. Any opposed? I would take that as being passed unanimously. <laughs> I visited in the DPP. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we just, uh, just ask, maybe at the staff level, if, um, when it comes to when, they, when we have endorsed it um, and we go through our regular communication mm -hmm. channels, if this could be, if we could tweet about it because BC Alliance is trying to raise its profile by tweeting, so then um, we can do that and we can show that we've endorsed it. Cause I think and then we don't want to tweet. <laughs> we know. <laughs> oh, we're doing very good on the tweeting. Yes, yes. yes. Are you offering to help the the, 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 the tweeting, tweeting remedial I, group? I don't want to know. No. 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 This is why we have young staff. Thank <laughs> you. Well, it's, it's okay. We're old people that like normal communication. We will do. Now. We will call yeah, all. All, all, it, all it. If I can just say, all it means is we take whatever we put in our newsletter about it. We just copy and paste that into different. Channels. Sure. Yeah. I think it automatically does. Uh, I think you put on Facebook, it's automatically yeah. tweeted. So I don't know what we. But, yeah. but just yeah, but just some of our minor things go. This is kind of minor. We normally do it for a big. So I mean, it's relevant awesome. to the dot, the motion we just passed, and I sort of didn't stick my hand up one way or the other because the links on the agenda package where it says sign the declaration or download here don't work. So I have absolutely no idea nor would the public, of what the declaration says. Mm -hmm. We should have that in yeah. argument. And the communities on the move, if, if it, there is a thing that says sign the declaration and download here, but they're not live, they don't work. So I think for the benefit of the general public, they should be added as separate documents to the agenda so people can see what it was so, that we... Council members, I, I, I understand, I think, in the attachment, you mean, for yeah. the letter? So yeah. it gives the actual link, but because it was an email, it had to be converted to a PDF, but the link... No, 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 I'm in Communities on the Move, the actual link. Page 102. Page 101. 102. The, keep going. The, the, you've got the email, and then there's the next document. Okay, I see. And then at the very bottom, it says download here, so that that's the declaration. Right, I see. So we don't have the actual declaration in our agenda package. Gotcha. Right. So we voted to approve something. That we don't but it does say in the letter from Ali Flack, how to endorse communities on the move. We encourage you to show your support for communities on the move. Please visit blah de, blah blah. Yeah, but those them. links yeah. aren't live. They don't work. The one above it does. And I'm, I'm and in here. I'm pushing this. Nothing happens. And I'm down it's, here and pushing both of these, and nothing happens. It takes about. And I'm in agenda mode. But it takes about thirty seconds to just key it in the declaration is on the bchealthandliving.ca 
yes. website, and there's a list of 73 organizations and municipalities. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not much. disagreeing that all that's there. Well, can I hear you? And yeah, yeah. I mean, I these are the public, I think the actual we declaration needs yeah. to this be in the agenda. Hard copy of the, or electronic copy of the declaration from now on. In the agenda. Something along those lines, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. So when we sign this, I just fill out the form. Or somebody just fills up the form and sends it off to them and says we're an endorser. No, you don't need to include your special signature. Oh, darn. <laughs> I think it's that simple, yes. Yeah. We can do that. Okay. But there's someone has to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> okay. So next up, we have... No, we passed that. It's Ben, the Metro Vancouver director. Councillor Nicholson. So we have two Metro meetings this week. The first one is this Wednesday at Municipal Hall. It will be preceded by a, a walkabout in David's Orchard. So this is the visit of the Metro Parks Committee um, and consideration of the two options that are uh, being proposed by uh, Metro staff for the David's Orchard. And um, I sent you a link about them. Um, members of the community are finding their way to that link and reading through material. It's an open meeting um, uh, on Wednesday, so you're, you're welcome to come. There'll be a closed component that deals with other matters. But um, this is the first time the committee's been here in uh, living memory, um, <laughs> as far as I, I, I'm aware. Um, they, they have been here before, but as part of a conference as a regional parks conference oh they were here to approve the golf course in Crippen park a million years ago okay. and uh, <laughs> protesters showed up and they voted against putting the golf course in the park so that but that was a meeting of the uh, metro and that would have been in the 80s? No. Like the 80s, the 90s. Yeah, it wasn't due to GBRD. I was in the 80s. The GBRD was just a day that will live in infamy. Anyway, when is the closed meeting part, if I read the agenda correctly, is at the end? The closed meeting is always at the end. Yeah. So how much puts the time of the meeting? Or from about 10 o'clock onwards, they'll be here. From 9 o'clock onwards, they'll be in the orchard. Okay, that so part they're coming over on the 8 o'clock period? They're coming over on the, on the 8 o'clock. Okay, so sorry. They, they, if we want to do the walkabout with them at the orchard, we should meet them down there? And, uh, I don't know if we're actually invited. <laughs> okay, we're not there. They're meeting with us up here after they have done their walk. Yeah. Well, they're not actually meeting with us. They're not meeting with council. We're sitting up here. I see. They are, they are just we are, we are having our forward. regular Metro Parks meeting. And the committee will be talking about the, the, the two options. And then depending on the, the, the outcome of this meeting, will either be um, a vote to approve sending the two options forward to the Metro Board to get Metro's okay um, to do further public consultation or staff will be given other direction. Um, my expectation is that between Wednesday and the time that the Metro Board looks at the options that they will try to have a meeting with Council. That was what we had talked about with Jeff um, Fitzpatrick uh, in the past because I don't think they want to go to the Metro Board without having discussed the options with us as a council and being able to say we were consultative and we have feedback from Bowen Council, et cetera. Okay, and how many people will be meeting here? Um, I think there are about 12 members of the, um, the committee and then there'll be the staff contingent. Wow, is this so, going to be big enough for them all? Sure, 20-ish 20 20 people. 20-ish, 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 people. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. No, it's just the committee, sorry, just the committee at the table and then staff in the audience and gotcha. members of the public in the audience, including council. So at the moment, I'm not aware of any confirmed delegations for the, uh, when do uh, we have to apply the meeting date? Last week. So, um, yeah. So we'll, we'll have a, a sense of what's, what might be done there and, and either option represents either a, a the, uh, the one that takes, keeps four cottages and takes down six 
has an $800,000 investment in the land, and the one that keeps six cottages and takes down four is a $1.3 million investment. In but the there's more money in that than just taking down cottages. There's all sorts of other stuff when I went in and read the detail. The taking down of the cottages is beyond the very, funds that are is a very inexpensive. The funds that are allocated are yeah. for park remediation, shifting parking lots, putting in a nature place gate, and, and so on. So it's, it's the whole package. Yeah. Once uh, a plan is adopted, what's the sort of time frame for, for implementation? Um, have been told uh, officially, we will probably go through that on Wednesday, but the way that things have worked in the past with um, larger capital projects like this is that um, if, if the plan is approved, um, so we've gone through the, this initial step, public consultation, it goes back to the Parks Committee, and then it would come back, I expect, to us again, if there were substantive changes, and then it would go to the Metro Board. So most likely it would come back to the Committee in September, and possibly to the Board in September, possibly October, and then the capital expenditures would need to be built into the capital budget in 2018. Mm -hmm. So um, if it were approved in the early, if something were approved yeah. in the early fall, then it's possible some work might be done under this year's capital budget because okay. there were some funds in, in place, but it's also possible that it might flip over into 2018. But it's not something that's on on a far horizon. So it would be imminent, so sort of like within the next five years? Oh, uh, no, within, within the next year. Great. Okay. Very exciting. I think, that, I think awesome. that would add a lot of excitement to the yeah. plan to know that once a plan was finally decided upon, that it would be quick, yeah. you know, swift movement. I think that no, would be so. yeah. it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the park um, manager's uh, work plan that the decision will be taken in the third quarter of 2017. Great, that's really exciting. And then we've got our board meeting on Friday. You show me the new park? Oh yes, and we have a new park. Um, and you would have received information about it's that. In yes, it's in the, it's in the package. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of other Metro Vancouver material in there to do with the, the new park, which Parks is just ecstatic about and a little frightened by. The, the new Grouse Park, whatever it's on that we called. And there's also the homelessness um, report in your agenda package. And the overall for the region, there's been a 30% increase in homelessness. Um, the North Shore has actually gone down in terms of there are fewer homeless people on the North Shore. This report does not include some of the expanded data collection that they did to cover people who were um, living in what, what they call waterways. So it doesn't at this point reflect um, any little boards in any of the, of the region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just ask people doing these surveys, mm -hmm. I have some understanding of how very difficult this is, and, and trying to get numbers on this is, is, is really, really hard. When you, when you looked at them, when did you feel that the, the numbers were probably as accurate as we could reasonably expect to get? Yeah, yeah. they worked with a non-profit organization that has a lot of experience and, and trust okay. with, um, with the homeless mm -hmm. um, community. Um, and the method that they used was not particularly intrusive. So I, I think given that. Yeah. And also the, the, the numbers made sense to me just in terms of where the increases were and what was coming out from those communities, the really big increases in Langley and in, in Maple Ridge, because that's where a lot of the very high level concerns are, are, are the coming from. Yeah, the Cape Court cases and the campgrounds. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I was first report. Yes, um, Well, two things. One is, Sort of island stress because island stress has been dealing with derelict vessels and that kind of thing. But um, I have pictures of black eyes being towed out of Man Bay yesterday. Yes, yes so, indeed. So I thought <laughs> that kudos uh, to, to all the hard work that Bonnie did. I have no idea what, you know, what's happening to it after it gets to 
Richmond, but that's fine. Um, and the other thing is, um, which I did inquire for, but we've received as Island's trustees a document that was sent to the Island's trustees. It's a survey of local government elected officials on responsible conduct. And there was a reference to it in the UBCM newsletter that it would be being sent. So did we not get something sent to either? No, we didn't. Or I don't recall seeing it being forwarded um, to I us. Thought, I thought it might be in the agenda, but it wasn't. So yeah, well, it's it's a survey for us, so I don't think it's anything that would go on the agenda. But I I have received it through the Alex Trust, but it's it should have been sent to all either corporate officers or CAOs to be distributed to their councils. Um, I believe Kristen sent it out while I was on vacation. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. Oh. We're pretty sure that's what she sent out. Oh, we'll yeah. double check the staff. Yeah. Yeah. Kristen Watson on uh, March 30th. Okay. Well, March 30th. Okay. So, yeah, I've got a dilemma. I don't know where I <laughs> Do I go for him to fill it up with her? <laughs> I haven't looked at it, but I just thought, uh, okay, that was, other than that, we haven't had any... Uh, I have a couple of things sure. just that are in our uh, information items, uh, just so that you can see. Um, item, well, it's on page 138. Um, yes, that's right. It's just related to uh, trust response to the changes in the province's approach to private mortgage. They're, they're, the province has proposed to make a bunch of changes, including kind of throwing it open and, and uh, not uh, not having guidelines uh, there. So, um, but it doesn't apply to our area. It applies to the Islands Trust area. No, but it doesn't apply. I, I just wanted to draw people's yeah. attention to it because we are an island within the Islands Trust. No, but I guess from a people's attention, it doesn't apply to how sound and such as well. Um, the new rules. No. No. Yeah. Not yet. But yeah. as a as a islands trust area, they're trying to make the case that we need uh, special treatment, and that oh, there yeah. are. Yeah. And they're also speaking to rules in the in the future. So I just thought people would like to know that. And then related to twelve point nine, which is the um, uh, request to endorse uh, rural heritage site for the state of C, um, the islands trusts. Uh, Response to that is in 1210C, and uh, that just means they endorse it in principle, but can't endorse it completely without uh, having the input of the First Nations first. And so, under our new uh, First Nations policy, so that's all. I just wanted to clarify. That. Okay, so that reminded me. Um, we haven't done anything. This was a request, so it's in the information 12.9 was asking for an action. So should we as a municipal council put it as a business item on our next agenda and pass the same resolution that the Islands Trust did? Yeah. Yes. So can we request that? Be an information, uh, via an business item for financial yeah. correspondence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from our office trustees? No. Okay, so let's go to item 3.4 of the consent agenda. And that was, and still is, the nice. exemption for that region. Yeah, I, I just really make this quick. Um, I just find it interesting on this one that we were also included in our package was like some um, emails from surrounding neighbors. And it's the first time that I've sort of had any sense of what the neighbors feel about these events. And it just raised a, some, a few minor concerns from the neighbors. And I was just wondering um, if, we're, if it's possible to just um, provide some feedback or encourage the Legion maybe to take those comments on board just so that they don't get disgruntled mm -hmm. residents. I think from my sense, it sounds like people are kind of okay, but perhaps maybe starting to lean maybe towards not so okay. So yeah, I, I just, it, if that was an opportunity there, just to sort of encourage yeah. the Legion just to pick up those comments and see if they could improve their yeah. relationships. Yeah. 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 Made some point from people who some of us have to apply lots of these licenses when midnight is actually quite late because the it says very clearly uh, until 12. Midnight's not midnight, because by the time everybody's wrapped up, said goodbye, 
And of course, by now, everyone's talking close three to times the usual volumes. And the, 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 the parking lot and the slamming of doors. I kind of get it why this in a residential area. And, a, and I, I'm glad that someone just wants to make them more aware. I'm not sure that. You, you know, you can kind of, I kind of get the feel that maybe they, they should be aware. Would 11.30 be better? I, I, I'm asking the question. I am not making this as motion, but I'm saying there may be some increased sensitivity about this. Uh, I, I, I get it. Midnight, because midnight is not midnight. Midnight is the closing. What's the deal? Are they closing the bar at midnight? Yeah. So in case everybody leaves and they're in the parking lot. Time to go. So just some thoughtfulness, maybe. Well, maybe that cap should be a little bit more yeah. strongly. And then, of course, the only point I'm going to is the... Um, it's an issue in the summer, not the winter. Right? Everybody's got their windows closed in the winter. True. You don't notice that the drugs up in the parking lot at the beach and down the street, but in the middle of the summer, you're stopping there. still in the parking lot. Um, what I was going to say was, I mean, it has been an ongoing issue since we incorporated, which is why the good neighbor agreement was put in place. Uh, I read, actually read the comments and have some concerns. Our emergency uh, plan coordinator contacted the region about using that as a reception center. Um, what they wanted in return was uh, that we uh, uh, re relax the requirements of the good neighbor agreement, which we said no to. So I am a little concerned about how they are interacting with their neighbors, just based on that. But we will talk to them. Yeah. Okay. So I'll quickly read through the recommendation as I was going to call it. Uh, a council approved the application made by the Royal Canadian Legion for exemption to noise control bylaw number 108 2004 for a public indoor event to be held at the Bowen Island Region 1265 Scarborough Road between 8 p.m. Monday 13th 2017 and 12 a.m. May 14th 2017. Okay, a seconder and all in favor and so our uh, last one is the IPMP research report that you want to speak to with me on. I'm, I'm really hoping everybody's found a chance to, to read through it, and if you have any questions, I know um, and I would probably be happy to. I'm just wondering, uh, because uh, Sophie wasn't able to send it to me on Friday because the file was too big. Is there uh, a re resolution that you're looking for from council? I couldn't quite see that. Anymore. I don't believe so. Okay. I think it was just there for information and an opportunity for council then if they had any um, questions about the report before we go. This will be the, the next step. We'll be putting the plan together. So this is just a check-in to sort of see what the plan is starting to look like. So if you have any questions, it's an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and they brought a question up for me. And it's more for this probably guide towards some more towards you, Kathy. Um, I noticed on the website that we've, um, we've put out a request for proposals for the preparation of an infrastructure master plan, which I'm totally excited about. I'm sure the mayor of Lions Bay, I think he goes to sleep with his <laughs> bill, so I think that's a really vital step. And I read through it, and there isn't really much mention. And I'll just read out what the plan, what the request is. The plan will document existing infrastructure, estimate the required investment necessary to optimize and extend the lifespan of current assets, identify required capacity for both existing and proposed infrastructure, and provide a prioritization action plan for strategic future infrastructure investments for the next 5, 10, 20 years. So when I read through the infrastructure master plan, the RFP, there wasn't much mention of active transportation in there. And so I was just wondering, how do we get the plan for the IPMP? But what, how does that stretch the dovetail? That was my question. Whether there been any internal conversations now that we've got documents coming together coming out of IPMP, is there a way that that will start to see? Yeah. All, all of our, I don't know, I'll let Alice speak to this too, but all of our draft master plans will be forwarded to the consultants. <laughs> Yes, that's okay. the overall picture. Okay. Without that, yeah, we would. Okay. This is really uh, something that's coming out of the finance department and the finance committee and through the, any grants we apply for. It's really what's called the, the names used to be asset management plan. Yeah. So it's documenting what we've got, what state of repair it's in, and how much money we've got to spend to keep it in a good state of repair. So it's sort of the first phase. Um, I'm, I'm really, like, I've, I've yeah. sat in a lot of the workshops for, yeah. the, for yeah. asset management, so I'm, I'm 
yeah, familiar for it. Like I understand you know, where this is future. Yeah, the future. Yeah. 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 It's just when yeah. I read through um, the sections on roads and stuff, there was just no mention of what we, you know, planned, mm -hmm. what we're like upkeep of the shoulders and stuff. And I thought that was, I just had concerns about that. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I pulled it and was just wanted to make sure that these plans would mm -hmm. dovetail. Absolutely. Especially because if you look at the research report, it does say. Um, that we're hoping that steps will be taken within five years for um, portions of the pedestrian and cycling network. So those that will obviously need a yeah. budget consideration. They will fold down in the first master plan with the key documents. So going back to 12.13. So the next steps are, so that the general public and everybody will sort of know what's this is not going for public consultation. The plan is going to be developed, and then the plan will be taken. There'll be an open house on on this date or on this yeah. document. Yeah, within the next month or so. It will be held one evening here. I think we have set a date. I don't have it in my mind. Yeah, but I think at, at our last meeting we set it. Um, so there'll be a yeah. And there's been tons of input now. Mm -hmm. Up to yeah. of course. Right. Um, I got a little lost going through this document. Okay. There's a lot of material in it. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of simple suggestions would be to um, create a table of contents okay. so that you have a sense of what the whole document mm -hmm. is about. And with some of the material in the appendices, I wasn't altogether clear what they were. So, but the urban systems material, but was that something done for a specific purpose? The city of Surrey, I, I needed a paragraph or so telling me why, 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 why this was here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And what I should, how that material informed the um, initial part of the, of the research report. And I, I mean, I was really impressed by the breadth of the material, but I was occasionally puzzled by it. Puzzled, puzzled, puzzled by, where it fits in within the plan, or puzzled where? Did the ITMP commission this? Was this something that was in a report that had been done uh, five years ago that had, had sat? Was this something that had been done by another municipality to accomplish this, that, and the other goal? On so that it's that preamble. Oh, for, for the appendix. appendix. Yeah. For, okay, for the appendix. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. For the report. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. No, I get I get your your points on the appendix because they're basically just kind of information bits and yeah. Okay. Did and just some con the table context we are told to me. Yeah. yeah. And just if I may, um, the very beginning um, of the document, and like in the introduction, you may say how much public input has already gone into this report because it just sort of starts yeah. um, implementing the ideas and just a, a little bit of. Background on background. the process to yeah on okay. what, what, what happened in the previous phases yeah. 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 Yeah, and the including the public input yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then I think it would be easier to read okay yeah it's exciting and off the bottom this is just sort of background general information right there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. standards for paragraphs and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff that's in the yeah. is it how relevant is that to the the report itself. These are just appendices of, of different types of information available. Or yeah. Well, that's appendices. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But why are those appendices there? What's the context that they're in? Yeah. Yeah. I was having fair enough. That's. I like the strategies and the, uh, you know, the main stuff at the at the top um, about the connections, choices, and health. So that's the other question. On some of the maps, there's. Proposed paths and whatever. So, how did that? Do those maps jive with the maps that parks, and trails, and greenways have come up with? I mean, are we going to have two proposed trails connecting two areas that are totally different locations? As I understand it, um, and like the document behind you, trails are sort of for recreational uses. Mm -hmm. They take you out into nature. Um, these paths and are more for the transportation side of things. I expect there will be lots of interconnections. Uh, so they're prob but there probably will be two maps because they're for two different audiences and yeah. two different functions. Yeah. Well, but yeah, people will use them for all kinds of things. Yeah. Well, yeah, because to have 
two things that are practically parallel that double the cost. I don't I think don't. they're parallel at all. Yeah. No, these ones are okay. pretty much following. Ultimately, they won't be. Yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And if you well, look yeah. at them, they're following mostly the shoulders of the roads, and the they will connect your trails and a half. So you can go from. You need to get from one community to another. You have the combination of trails and paths. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Just a quick question, not in reference to that, but what's this, um, the handout at the end, the Twin Island Bill? <laughs> non table item? Yeah. I don't think I should figure that out myself. Somebody grabbed one of the other handouts. No, not another bill from Twin Island. Oh. I've got my notes written on the back of it. Oh, Everyone just ripped that off. <laughs> it was early this morning. But, uh, yeah, that I, I just figured it was attached because that was I was at here at eight o'clock and nobody else was printing anything. Oh yeah. So it yeah. must have been on there anyway. So that's interesting. All right, well we'll do that. I can just think of it. Yeah, let it go this time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Are we trying to be adjourned, Mr. Mayor? I'm trying to. We got a closed meeting. Yes, I hope that we adjourn. We are hope we're adjourned. The chair says we're adjourned. Well, good. Thank you. Because we can't, I have a possible request for a two minute break. Certainly. Well, we oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We've got a two minute close down. Yeah. 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 Y